to make the uh, recording available on our YouTube channel after the class. So we will uh, have some information about how to connect with that afterwards. Um, but just for your reference, you, it is being recorded. All right, so you got um, my name there, Tony Johnson. I'm a natural resource educator for the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. I am a forestry educator. My office is in Fond du Lac. When I go to my office, I'm presenting from my home tonight, which is just outside of uh, Fond du Lac, but in Fond du Lac County. Um, and again, feel free to use that email if you've got any questions that are specific to me. I'll have some more contact information at the end of the presentation. Um, I just want to encourage everybody to continue using that chat throughout the presentation. I'm going to be referencing that and there's going to be some resources and guides that will be put in the chat as we move along. So um, just, just keep an eye on that. That's going to be a great way to interact as we um, go through the presentation. Okay, without further ado, the learning outcome. So I'd like to start out with just kind of the central themes that I'd like folks to take away from this lecture. Uh, number one is just understanding uh, what we mean by invasive plants so that we're all on the same page and then talk a little bit about why uh, that term invasive and what it means, why that matters to you as a landowner. Uh, and as we get into that conversation, we're gonna be discussing a couple important invasive species in Wisconsin woodlands, but again, we're not going to be covering all the invasive species that you're going to be seeing in your woods, but hopefully we'll give you some tips and resources for finding information about those species and some uh, a framework for understanding how to control invasive species more broadly than just the individuals that we're looking at. So the last part of the presentation is going to specifically look at some of those control options and strategies, and we'll talk about those for specific species. Okay, so I like to start out uh, just with this picture of the early vegetation of Wisconsin. So this is one of the earliest, I think the earliest plant survey that was done uh, in the state of Wisconsin. It's data that was compiled by John T. Curtis in a seminal book, Vegetation of Wisconsin, published in 1959. But basically, this is the best snapshot that we have of what the plant communities looked like in the state of Wisconsin upon European arrival. So the individual colors and um, what uh, they represent doesn't matter as much as the fact that we see a wide diversity of uh, vegetation types across the state of Wisconsin. And I outlined uh, the counties um, that we're targeting with tonight's classes. So you can see in uh, Vernon and Richland County, you've got a lot of uh, oak savanna range as well as uh, most of Richland County being Southern uh, Mazic Forest pre-settlement. Um, and then in Wapaka, you, there's four or five different habitat types and you're kind of straddling what was called the, the tension zone across the, the state where you get a, a separation between the major habitat types in the north and the south. Um, but when we're looking at this map, I think it's important to understand that this, again, is just a snapshot in time and it's largely a result of two major factors in Wisconsin's uh, landscape history, which were the glaciation uh, the most recent glaciation events, as well as uh, the prior glaciation events. Um, obviously, they did not touch the, the Driftless area, given the, the moniker of the Driftless, um, but it had an enormous impact on the vegetation that remained in those areas. You can imagine if you're surrounded by a glacier, the, the change in the climate um, must have been much different than it is today. Um, and then post the uh, recession of the glaciers within the state of Wisconsin, you've got you know, over 10,000 years of land use practices by Native, uh, Native American communities, um, which had a major impact on what we're seeing on this map here. And then after this map, there's quite a bit of changes that were, were brought about within um, European settlements, starting with trapping, a uh, major reduction of beavers across the landscape had a, a big impact on the hydrology of the state as well as the vegetation communities. Um, in the Civil War era and Reconstruction era, you had a, a large um, industry around um, logging uh, within the state of Wisconsin, as well as during Reconstruction, the, the forests of Wisconsin were a, a major uh, supplier of materials for rebuilding. Um, after the cutover period, which is what that's uh, traditionally called, you've got uh, a lot of agricultural expansion within the state of Wisconsin, a lot of European immigrants that come over, uh, that came over during that time period, bring with them uh, seeds from their 
homelands as well as uh, farming practices that were much different than uh, historically existed in plant communities in Wisconsin. Um, and kind of what was discovered there is that not all the land in Wisconsin is fertile agricultural land. And we've seen in the last number of decades, a steady trend of reforestation across the state of Wisconsin, where now we're, we've got more trees on the landscape than we did a number of decades ago. And that's primarily because of marginal land being taken out of agricultural production um, and a number of other uh, land use changes that resulted in more forests on the landscape. And finally, we're kind of getting into this stage where particularly in my part of the state in the southeastern part of the state and the southwestern part of the state, there's a lot of parcelization of larger properties. So big uh, contiguous chunks of lands are being chopped up uh, through ownership changes and, and that's having a dramatic impact on forest communities. So with all that said, that's just kind of a, a background to say that we've got a long history of land use changes and vegetation changes across Wisconsin and we're in another period of change. And tonight we're talking about the role of invasive species in that. So it wouldn't be an extension presentation without the, um, the quote of Aldo Leopold here. So we've got one basically describing the fact that, you know, it was known in 1945 that when, um, the uh, fundamental um, management or the succession on a, a landscape changes that certain species can take advantage of that and uh, cause problems. So uh, Elder Leopold here is just making a, a reference to the fact that um, invasive species don't necessarily have to be native or non-native. Um, it's how they uh, react within the, the ecosystem that they're in. So that kind of leads us into um, a point where we should just put a couple definitions out on the table. Um, invasive is a, a term that depends a lot on your goal. A, a plant or a species that's invasive in one context might not be in another. So it's really important to understand your goals as a landowner and whether a species is impacting that or not. But two points that I like to key in on when thinking about invasive plant species is that they're established and spreading rapidly. So there's not, uh, there's no stasis in nature and here we're seeing a change in in favor of one particular species at the disadvantage of other species and then the other factor is that you're spreading the species but also having uh, potential or um, realized economic environmental or health harm so economic harm could be an invasive species that limits the ability of your desired species to produce so uh, like honeysuckle um, impacting the uh, reproduction uh, or regeneration of timber trees, um, environmental impacts. We often talk uh, about environmental services that ecosystems provide like uh, holding soil in place, providing fresh air uh, or clean water. Those are some environmental services that could be impacted if invasive species are damaging your forest ecosystem. Um, but really the nuts and bolts, kind of the framework that I wanna provide today is that it comes down to your goals for your woods. So you really have to think about what you want from your landscape and whether that's timber production or diverse and abundant wildlife or, you know, certain recreational values like hiking without having to, you know, go through a, a thicket of um, thorns. Those are all um, values that you may have or goals that you have for your property that could be impacted by invasive species. Okay, so what makes a plant invasive? Um, one factor is that they can tolerate a, a bunch of different conditions. So that could be moisture conditions, that could be soil conditions, uh, that could be temperature conditions. So they're just uh, very adaptable. They can uh, exist, they're, we would call it plastic. They're uh, able to express themselves in a number of different ways that they're able to be successful in different environments. And with that, they enjoy a, a longer growing period. So it's kind of interesting right now. I, uh, I'm happy to be doing this talk over the winter because in my part of the state, you can still see some green uh, buckthorn leaves hanging on where, um, you know, pretty much everything else has fallen other than some oak leaves that are holding on to uh, desiccated leaves. But it's uh, very obvious in the early spring and, and late fall that these plants are getting an advantage at the edges of seasons by uh, being able to continue to grow. So another factor is they often alter soil chemistry. So that um, plays into the community aspect of plants and how, you know, by changing the soil chemistry, they're benefiting their own uh, reproduction. As you can see by our uh, furry friend here, they're often prolific seed producers and that often includes um, 
dispersal uh, mechanisms like uh, Velcro, like here, or else many are blown in the wind. Um, other uh, invasive plants are able to spread vegetatively, so that you know would be analogous to you know if you chopped off your finger and we're able to re-sprout an entire new person from that finger. That's what a lot of our invasive plant species have the ability to do. So certain control mechanisms like plowing up a, a vegetatively propagated plant is not gonna be a successful control strategy. And then the other aspect is that they have few natural controls. So that just um, kind of goes without saying that they're, they do not have the uh, natural predators, bugs or, um, other players in their ecosystem to uh, compete with them and keep their prevalence down. So I always like to think about, you know, you've got information, but what are you gonna do about it? And the framework that we like to provide is, um, again, beginning with your goals and really thinking about what you want from your woodland and then putting all of your management uh, activities, so the, things that you do in your woods, kind of keep it in the context of your goals. Is that taking you towards your eventual uh, desired outcome or is it taking you in the opposite direction? Uh, the second step is knowing the how to identify plants and their biology because what a plant is and how it functions in the ecosystem is going to help you either manage it or propagate it. Um, and then we get into taking an inventory. So that's just uh, a process of keeping a record so that you can understand where your issues are on the landscape and give you a, a mechanism for tracking things over time. Cause that's gonna be really important with any type of invasive species management, which we'll talk about at the end of the class, a bunch of different opportunities, but really this is an ongoing process that's gonna have to continue. It's not a one, one treatment and you're done for almost any of the species that we're gonna be looking at. So again, we're gonna be continuing to monitor and adapt. It's a iterative process where we, we get through our plan and then we have to revisit our assumptions at the beginning and see whether we're taking ourselves in the right direction or not. So again, um, understanding the plants, you gotta know the forest and the trees. So you have to understand the community that the plants are operating in as well as the individual plants and how they fit into that community. I put uh, this picture, the field guide to terrestrial invasive plants in Wisconsin. This is a, a small publication that was produced by the Wisconsin DNR and it outlines, it does a really good job of um, giving a small portrait of the invasive species that are currently in Wisconsin and one that are the Department of Natural Resources is on the lookout for. This is a, a resource that is available to landowners in some DNR service centers uh, and I, I believe you can make requests to the DNR. I'm not sure where that comes through, but it, it is a document that's available free of charge. Um, but basically the, the point of this is that if we're gonna control an invasive plant species, we need to understand what it looks like throughout different parts of its life cycle. So a seedling is gonna look different from a mature tree. And then obviously we're gonna have differences between spring or between the growing season and the non-growing season, whether there's leaves or not. And then uh, a plant's uh, life cycle history is gonna be really important for understanding the pinch points of control. So uh, annual is a plant that only lives one year. Uh, they're often very prolific seed producers, but they're generally not um, major issues within forest ecosystems. Annual weeds are a much bigger threat in uh, agricultural landscapes where you're doing annual tillage and you're creating that annual disturbance that creates a uh, environment for uh, annual weeds. Not a major issue in forest ecosystems, but um, it's just something to keep in mind. And a biennial is a, a plant that's gonna live for, for at least two years, sometimes more, but generally they're going to be producing roots for a year or two, and then they're going to be producing flowers in a year. And that's just another key of thinking about when is the most effective time to control and how uh, to control those uh, types of plants. Perennials are like your tree species that persist for many years and have the opportunity to uh, put out seeds or runners for many years over time. And these are gonna be the biggest issue within most uh, woodland ecosystems. And then another factor that we wanna consider with any type of invasive, whether it's annual, biennial, or perennial, is just how does the plant disperse itself? Is it uh, spread by dogs or does it require flooding or, um, does it require a fire to open up a serotonous cone? There's a bunch of different way mechanisms and strategies plants have to disperse their seeds that if we can key into those uh, facts, we can 
be more effective as managers. So I don't expect you to take everything off this slide. I just wanted folks to be aware that there are tools like this that are available, uh, spreadsheets, and basically the plant life cycle informs the management and goal technique. So if your goal is to prevent seed formation, you've got um, you know, a couple different opportunities with biennials, uh, annuals, or simple herbaceous perennials. Um, but this is basically just showing you what the effective control strategies are. The, the stars are the recommended practices by extension. Um, and then on the bottom, we've got some management techniques and that just kind of relates to, you know, how you want to target plants based on their life cycle history. So again, this is available in one of the resources that I'll share later, but um, it's just a good idea to understand that there are these um, uh, references out there that focus on life cycle. Okay, now we're gonna jump into a little bit different part of our presentation where we're gonna look at some specific plants. So we got a couple pictures on your slide. This is a very common invasive uh, woody species. I'd like anybody who knows what it is to go into the chat feature and enter the name of this plant into the, the chat feature. And I'm particularly interested in if people have um, experience working with this plant on their landscape, if they've had success or issues controlling it in the past. If you've got any questions about this species, um, please enter that in the chat box as we go through. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll go to uh, question and answer and have an opportunity to, to get back to some of these questions. So I'm not looking at the chat, but I'm gonna advance and uh, just believe that somebody's got this right. It is garlic mustard and it is a biennial. So very common invasive species. Uh, by me and pretty much all over the state. It is one of those species that is uh, spread throughout the state and uh, eradication is you know, probably not feasible, but controlling it in isolated patches is something that can definitely be worked towards. So uh, some simple identification keys. There's a couple different leaf shapes that you'll see on the, the bottom left. You can see the uh, heart-shaped rosette from the first year plants. And then the, the top two, you've got more of a heart-shaped leaf and those are the the second year growth with the, the flower. So an a obvious way to tell this plants from some other um, spring ephemerals you might see would be to take the leaf and crush it up and it's got a, a garlic odor. There's a lot of um, different things people do with a garlic mustard to control it. There's pesto recipes and different ways you can use it, but it's a very, very prolific plant. Um, so some of the impacts garlic mustard has, it, it's one of those plants that we call allelopathic. So it alters the soil chemistry by releasing a toxin that inhibits other plants from growing. And the hypothesis here is that it disrupts the soil fungus associations. So forest uh, soils are dominated by uh, relationships with fungi. Um, so depending on the species of fungi that are in your forest, that's going to determine how quickly nutrients are recycled, how effectively leaves get broken down, um, and it's going to have a major impact on the, um, the sprouting of uh, your forest floor species. So uh, the map on the bottom left is from the Wisconsin First Detector Network and just a, a map of the reported sightings of the species. I think it's one that's been around so long and is so ubiquitous that we might just be missing some data because people have kind of gotten to the point where it is everywhere. But it is a species that does definitely impact the diversity in uh, forest floors. Um, so it's one to keep an eye on and is definitely um, one that we can have an impact on as managers. We'll talk a little bit more about control strategies later. Um, okay, to jump into the next species, uh, we've got a couple different pictures here. If you could just get to your chat feature and enter in the species name for this one. So again, we've got a, uh, well, this is a monocarpic perennial, but we'll call it a biennial for simplicity's sake. It basically starts out the first year with a, a small uh, basal rosette. So just a small uh, circle of leaves coming out of the ground and uh, focuses most of its energy on root production for the first year or several years. And then when conditions are right, the plant will bolt and create these flowers like you're seeing on the left. So uh, give them a couple minutes. Um, this is another widespread one. So this is uh, wild parsnip. Again, it's a monocarpic perennial or a, a biennial type species. Um, and that's gonna be important for when we think Tony. about controlling it. Yes. 
I have a garlic mustard question for you. Okay, great, yeah. Uh, Mary says uh, she sprayed with Roundup during the warm November temperatures. Wondered if this would do any good. And uh, she's planning on spraying again in spring. So the timing of when to treat garlic mustard, I guess is the question. Is November too late or about right? Um, November is not gonna be an ideal time to spray. Uh, it is a species that does most of its growth during the, the spring months and early summer. Um, and you could have an impact if you're seeing some of these basil rosettes and uh, stunting next year's plants from growing. The, the best time to control garlic mustard is gonna be before the plant flowers and produces seeds. This is one of those uh, invasives that is a prolific seed producer. So although you may be able to control some of the uh, vegetative growth from this fall to next spring, you're gonna have a lot of these annual seedlings that are gonna be popping up next year. Um, I'm not gonna say that it's uh, you know a bad thing to do because that's one of the uh, parts we're gonna talk about at the end is that it's really important to integrate strategies and have one more, more than one way that you're uh, targeting any specific species. So definitely not the, the ideal time to be spraying garlic mustard because of what I just mentioned, but it's um, you know not the worst. You've, you've got a couple things to deal with. You've got the seed producing plants and then you've got the vegetative growth that's gonna be coming back next year. So um, maybe in the Q and A, we can have uh, some other folks uh, chime in with um, some control strategies that they've found effective. So wild parsnip, um, I bring this one up uh, it is a shade intolerant species. Um, so it's not gonna be one that you're gonna find within your woodlands, but it's one of those species that you see a lot in uh, partially managed landscapes. So uh, roadway ditches or um, trails that folks have in their uh, property. Um, but basically we've got some identification characteristics here. It's this, uh, it's got this umble shaped flower, which is really important, uh, but there are a lot of um, species within this family. It's in the, the carrot family that, that look alike. Um, so it's one that you will certainly want to have your identification book as you're first getting used to it. Once you, once you know what it looks like, these leaves are pretty distinct. Um, so that's something to, to key in on, but it's good to have an identification book like the um, DNR reference that I uh, put out before. So it's got a really deep tap root. Like I mentioned, it's uh, going to be focusing most of its energy while it's uh, in the immature stage on producing that, that tap root. So it can be mowed several times and regrow. Um, but when it's ready to produce seeds, it shoots this runner with, or it shoots a stem up with a flower and can produce a lot of different seeds. And they do have the ability to um, stay viable. So the seeds last for a long time within the, the dirt too. And another reason why I bring this one up is because uh, wild parsnip is, uh, it produces a photo, uh, phytophotodermatitis phyto response, which means that phyto is plant, photo is sun, and dermatitis is a, a skin rash. So if you get the sap on your skin from one of these plants and then it's exposed to the sunlight, it, it produces a, a chemical reaction that causes a burn that can last months. And as you can see from the map, it's a very prolific species. So it's just one to have identified because you can get these, um, you know, really nasty uh, rashes while you're weed whacking it or mowing it. That is a control strategy. So it's just um, not a plant that you want to uh, stumble into. Okay, so now the more important uh, Invasive species for woodland management are perennials, like I mentioned before. And some of the uh, major features are just that they will grow many seasons. They um, survive with energy stored in their roots. So that's gonna be a way that we as managers can target those species. And they can, they've got more reproductive uh, strategies than annuals or biennials because they do seeds, suckers, roots, and depending on the, depending on the species, you can have a couple uh, different avenues to uh, try to impact perennials. So one important thing is just uh, to understand what type of root system perennials have. So simple roots like a honeysuckle are something that you could potentially pull out of the ground and get a whole plant out and, and remove it. Whereas uh, creeping or clonal roots like in a black locust are gonna break and you're just gonna have 
more young uh, black locust plants, wherever those were broken off. So it's imp really important to know the root structure of perennials. All right, so here is another opportunity to uh, show off your invasive species knowledge. If you could just enter in the chat feature, the name of this species. It is a uh, perennial woody species, very, very common in my area. We've actually got a couple different varieties up on the board here. Um, I will go ahead and advance this. So it's common in glossy buckthorn. We got common on the left and glossy on the right. And then on the bottom, we've actually got a black cherry. So that is a species that is a, a lookalike for buckthorn. And one, if you're doing a buckthorn removal and you've got black cherry, you wanna be really careful to uh, differentiate between these two species. And um, the obvious way to do it between uh, black cherry and common buckthorn is just looking for that uh, terminal thorn. You can see on the buckthorn here at the end of the branches, they're going to have these small um, thorns that are going to make it obvious cherries do not have thorns. Um, and then another feature at this time of the year, cherries are not going to be holding any of their leaves. So if a plant has uh, green leaves on it this time of the year or even late November, you know, you're, you're not dealing with a, a native. So just a little bit about the common and glossy buckthorn. Again, they're photosynthesizing in green before and after our native plant species. So, um, you know, it, it might just be that we're seeing some different climatic conditions uh, than the, our native plant species have experienced in the past. And these, you know, new invasive species have evolved in different climates and they're just able to uh, fit our new climate better than uh, the native species. Um, and, and part of it has to do with the uh, competition from uh, uh, predators. So um, again, there's, uh, you can easily identify buckthorn by these black berries. A lot of them will retain the berries well into the winter. They don't seem to be a, a choice fruit by the birds, at least in my neighborhood. But, um, and then again, in the bottom left, you can really see here how uh, a buckthorn thicket really sticks out in the fall and um, it forms kind of a very dense uh, monoculture thicket, so meaning just one plant species and doesn't have a ton of value for, for wildlife. So there are a couple ways to differentiate between common and glossy buckthorn. Uh, it turns out common buckthorn is also kind of glossy, so that's not the best way to do it. But uh, from my perspective, it's not all that important because they have very uh, similar life strategies. They're uh, perennials, they propagate via seeds, uh, they occupy a little different habitats. Um, but really, if you can identify from a, a buckthorn, a buckthorn is a buckthorn is a buckthorn, and uh, we do not have native buckthorn species in Wisconsin. So it is, if you find one that is either a common or a glossy, it is one that uh, could be a target for removal. And then the map in the middle is just a, a distribution of the two different species from the first detector network again. So again, it's, it's all over the state and you could, you could find it anywhere. It's one of those species that really uh, does well in uh, parcelized woodlots. So it's a, an edge species and can take advantage of those um, light conditions on the edges of woodlands. All right, so another one here, if anybody wants to enter in the chat, what species we're looking at here. Um, got actually three different species, but they're all invasive. We have got a number of different um, types of this species within the state. So these are uh, generally called the bush honeysuckles. There's five different species, I believe, within the state and a, a couple of natives. So um, this is one where you're going to see different flowering colors and some different characteristics based on the species, but we'll look at some general characteristics of the invasive versus the native so you can differentiate because there is a, an important invasive uh, or an important native honeysuckle as well. So we'll just classify the invasives as bush honeysuckles because that's the form that they take. They're uh, a bushy form, multi-stem perennial. Um, here they, it says they do really good in upland habitats, so under roost trees. Roost trees means uh, birds come and basically poop out uh, the seeds from berries that they've eaten in other areas. So you'll 
often see them, you know, where birds will congregate, you'll see these uh, trees that are dispersed via um, seeds often underneath those. Again, the blooms for the bush honeysuckles are kind of in the early part of summer and you'll see anywhere from white to yellow to orange to pink. They're, they're very beautiful flowers and they were brought over for that reason. They're uh, ornamental um, species. Um, again, this is another one with uh, early leaf out and a late leaf drop. And there has been some interesting research that uh, is correlating um, bush honeysuckle invasions with uh, reduced timber regeneration. So they're forming these thickets and are impacting uh, your crop tree species from uh, growing either as quickly or as straight or in a quality that um, is going to be saleable. So again, this is just another kind of uh, picture showing the dispersal mechanism here. I had a professor as an undergraduate who described this as the the dicky bird hypothesis of uh, evolution where dispersal is so often governed by small birds that are carrying seeds around where you can really understand a lot about why plants are where they are if you become an ornithologist. <laughs> but here is a map of a bunch of different uh, bush honeysuckle varieties uh, mapped throughout the state of Wisconsin. So each one is for a different variety or a different species. Um, but as you can see, they're pretty ubiquitous throughout the state. Okay, so this slide is uh, got the, a red line in the middle. It's kind of uh, faint, but on one side of the line are the native species and on the other side of the line are the non-native. Can anybody guess which is which? Is the right side native or is the left side native? And kind of the big takeaway that I wanna make here is that even if you don't know the species level, you can tell whether a honeysuckle is native or non-native based on its form. So the native is on the left and the non-native is on the right. And kind of the key characteristics here are that the, the non-native are these uh, bush honeysuckles. So they come in a, a bush form, multi-stemmed, uh, three to 15 feet, and they've got a hollow pith. So if you cut the stem, it's gonna be hollow inside. And the, the fly honeysuckle, which is a common name of a native variety has a, uh, filled in pith, if you cut it, it's a, also um, a vine-like species. So that's the big difference is they're not going to be having that uh, bush-like shape. They're going to be viney and a much more delicate plant. And the difference between these two species is really important when we think about native wildlife like uh, pollinators. The a primary issue with non-native species is that although they oftentimes produce uh, showy flowers, they don't have, they oftentimes don't have nectar or pollen resources that are going to uh, be usable by our uh, pollinator species, so our insects. And insects are really the foundation of a lot of our, um, you know, right above the, the plants as primary producers, insects are a key driver in the diversity of our ecosystems just because they're a food source for fo so many uh, different types of wildlife. Okay, so I'm going to try to brush through this a little bit more quickly in the last half so we can get into some some questions, but uh, does anybody know this species? We've got the berries on top. Um, it's very common in ornamental areas. You can feel free to enter it in the chat if you know it. Um, this is called Japanese barberry. I've actually, uh, <laughs> not happy to admit it, but I've got a small one in my yard from the prior landowner and should probably be removed because I do find some seedlings that uh, sneak out into the rockier parts of my landscape. But um, this is a important woodland invader in uh, many parts of Wisconsin and it's one of these escapees from, uh, from residential uh, plantings oftentimes. And, one of the really important parts of or impacts of uh, Japanese barberry is that it is, it's a spiny plant. So if you have a thicket of barberry, it's gonna be really nasty to walk through and impact the recreational value of your forest. And it's also been shown to uh, be great habitat for deer ticks who are the primary carrier of Lyme's disease. So there is some um, correlated evidence between uh, deer tick abundance and uh, the prevalence of Japanese barberry. So it's just another reason to to think about controlling this species. Again, here we've got 
you can see it's uh, distributed throughout the state, not quite as uh, widely as some of our other species. But again, it's a, a shrub that grows two to six feet tall and um, yeah, has these nasty thorns on it. So when you get up close, you can't mistake it. All right, um, I think this is the last species that we look at here in detail. Um, does anybody got any guesses for what this one is? Kind of looks like a green wall to me. This is uh, Oriental Bittersweet. This picture was taken uh, just across the border in Minnesota by a Department of Transportation over there and it was all cleared, but there was an evergreen behind one part of it and a fence behind another. Um, so this is a perennial vine, Oriental Bittersweet. It's a, a climbing woody vine. It can grow uh, really tall and can live for a long period of time and has some pretty serious impacts on uh, forest communities. And one of the primary dispersal <laughs> vectors for this one is or ornaments. So it, these uh, nice seeds and vines can make wreaths and other uh, decorative type stuff. And if these seeds get out, they remain uh, viable even after they've been in your house for a number of years. So, um, you know, it's just really important to be conscious of the plant material you're bringing onto your landscape. So here's just a, a picture of that vine strangling some trees and uh, tearing down another set of trees. But it, uh, yeah, like it says here, it reduces the light availability to the understory and um, can really impact, you know, all trees that had been healthy beforehand. So there, this one's a little complicated because there is a, a native variety of the bittersweet, which does have um, some good wildlife properties and is a great species to find in your woodland. And it, it does occur on similar habitat as the oriental bittersweet. Um, so just a couple of distinguishing characteristics here. We've got the, the fruit capsule is something to look at. So the color there, you can see the difference. There's one is orange and the other is yellow. And then the position of the fruit, one of the positions there is uh, at the terminal or the ends of the branches. And then for the oriental variety, it's at the leaf axles. So can anybody guess whether the right side or the left side is the, the native or the um, invasive? So the native is on the left. You can know the native is orange, uh, oriental is yellow for these uh, capsule colors. And that's gonna be a really um, definitive way to, to find those because those capsules will stay on the, the trees for some time. Okay, so I just wanted to make one point that there are a lot of problem ornamental species found throughout Wisconsin woodland. So it's really important whenever you're going to purchase plant material at big box stores and uh, you know other uh, nurseries to just know that the DNR has a list of uh, invasive species that are prohibited from uh, bringing onto your landscape and then some other restricted species as well. Um, we're not getting into the, the legal side of things, but just, just be aware that you know you can buy invasive plants at the store today and bring them home and cause problems for yourself. So just be really aware uh, of that opportunity. Okay, I, I lied. There's one more invasive species. Can anybody see what invasive species is on this slide? Right. So it's earthworms, and they're you know sometimes forgotten about, but in the case of Woodlands, uh, particularly in you know uh, northern North America and our uh, landscapes that were so impacted by glaciers, they're not native species here, and they make dramatic impacts on forest ecosystems. So I mentioned before that forest soils are dominated by um, fungal communities, and the um, the bacteria within the uh, worms' guts, as well as the worms themselves, kind of change the components of uh, those communities so that they're much more bacterial driven. So you're going to have less decaying um, leaf litter and other uh, plant detritus, and you're going to have more microbial processes, which is going to really speed up the decomposition and mineralization of forest soil. So again, we've, we live in uh, ecosystems that were not adapted to these conditions, and this increased disturbance from worms just opens up uh, opportunities for other invasive species to um, take over your woodland. So this is just kind of a side-by-side -side picture of the difference between, you know, a, a woodland that's got um, in, invasive worms in it. You can just see no leaf litter on the, on the right. And that's going to really, I can't say this enough, it's really impacting the soil 
uh, community, which is a fundamental driver of forest health. Okay, so now we're moving on to the next step. We've got an idea of some of the species that are out on the landscape and it's gonna be really important now to take an inventory. This is an example of just a map where we've got uh, garlic mustard uh, mapped and the size of the dot is associated with the um, diameter of the uh, infestation. And you can see we've got the primary area in the bottom left and then the kind of more scattered area in the right. And it's just really important to, to create maps so that we have an idea of how things are changing over the time and we have the abil ability to prioritize our work ahead of time. So you can do this with aerial photos or um, you can even draw out your uh, land on a piece of paper. Um, but then the next step is, is taking that map and trying to put some, some plant information on there. So you're estimating the species that are present, the density of those species, and trying to get a spatial representation on your map of what's actually happening on the land. And the other important part of an inventory is really thinking about your land uses and where you're going to be um, and the actual impacts on that land are the way the land is what I'm trying to say is the way you use the land is going to impact your strategy for controlling invasive species. So I've got some online resources at the bottom there. I will refer more to the Wisconsin first detector network coming up here, but I'm going to just try to speed up a little bit so that we can get to um, more of the conversation and question and answer part. So this is just a illustration of a map here. We got a bunch of different species and you can kind of see how this allows you to figure out where your priorities are. So you're gonna think about what are the important parts of your habitat on your woods? Cause not each acre is created equal if your goal is to house wildlife. And then you're also gonna be thinking about the size of the population of your invasive, where they're spreading, um, what, access you have to different parts, what resources are available as far as equipment. And then also you've, you're thinking about the way that these plants life cycles impact their control as well. And you may have some other priorities that um, fit into that, but kind of some general strategies are, again, monitoring, this is gonna be multi-year work. So you want to keep track of what you're doing and how that's impacting the invasive species that you're working on. Um, and we've got just some general, uh, precautions here um, as far as starting the process without invasive species and leaving it that way. Um, timing is going to be really important. There's uh, uh, yeah, a bunch of different factors as far as control and management strategies and we can get more into that in the Q&A. But there's a, a lot of different methods um, depending on the type of plant species. I think uh, prevention is really the most important feature here. So early detection and prevention of the spread is gonna be number one. And then depending on your species, some of these other methods might come into play. Um, and, and again, the prevention, a, a big part of this is gonna be uh, associated with timber management too. If you're inviting people onto your land, make sure that they're aware of the precautions you're taking to prevent invasive species spreading. So pulling, there's a lot of ways to pull invasive species. This is great for um, some of your perennial species. We've got the, uh, some folks pulling uh, garlic mustard here. You can use a woolly bear like the top right to pull out uh, honeysuckle or buckthorn. Um, but timing is gonna be really important when we're thinking about pulling. And also, as you can see here, having a group is a, a great way to get some of this work done. Mowing and cutting is another opportunity. Uh, it's gonna weaken the plant and this is gonna be a strategy that you're gonna to have to you know, time out and repeat. Uh, there's a bunch of different equipment that we could get into regarding mowing. Um, and it's all gonna be kind of species specific as well. Grazing is an, another opportunity very similar to mowing in principle, but you're working with animals. I know the DNR is doing this on some of their private land where they're inviting private, uh, or I'm sorry, on some of their public land, they're inviting uh, private uh, livestock owners to come out and graze in order to control invasive species. There's some uh, good research coming out here um, around that. Girdling, uh, tried and true uh, method for controlling woody invasive species. Um, and that's just made by cutting bark and leaving the plant stand. Cut stem, this is uh, where you're cutting the plant and also using an herbicide to, to treat the plant. This is a really effective way to control uh, buckthorn and honeysuckle. Um, and it's gonna be paired with a herbicide use. So just 
talked a little bit more about the targeted species, often for shrubs and trees. You're going to use a systemic herbicide, which means that you're going to paint on the herbicide and it's going to spread throughout the plant. Um, we got a lot of timing considerations on that as well as technique too. Foliar herbicide is enough. I, I apologize for going through this so quickly, but I really want to get into um, questions and talk with the DNR foresters about their experience in applying some of these methods. So foliar herbicide is really for widespread uh, infestations because you have the opportunity, you have the chance of uh, drifting onto desirable plant species. And again, timing timing is really everything with all of these. So man, matching your control method with the proper timing with the species that you're trying to control. Basal bark application of herbicides is just another way to get herbicides onto plants. Um, prescribed fire is another management opportunity. Just uh, uh, it takes quite a bit more coordination and expertise, but it is kind of a larger uh, disturbance pattern that can help promote native species on your landscape. But I guess the, the point that I want folks to take away from all of these control strategies is just the fact that you've got to integrate a lot of these different methods. Maybe you burn in the spring and then you mow the regrowth and then you spray that regrowth and then you uh, cut it down and spray it again. There's going to be, depending on the species, um, a lot of different points to control that species. And then um, it's just a matter of matching that with the proper timing. So some other precautions again is just, you know, prevention is the number one thing to keep your woods healthy. It's going to be really tough when you've got established invasive species, you know, with a limited budget or limited time to go in and have any type of an impact on that. So uh, spending regular time monitoring your woods and keeping an eye on people who are accessing your woods is a good, um, good precaution. So finally, just some other resources to share. Uh, UW-Madison Extension has uh, the first detector network, which is the website on the bottom right here. They've got a really great um, page for learning about specific invasive species. And they've got all of Extension's fact sheets that um, dive into the specific uh, herbicides that are used and timing considerations for species. Um, and then also the DNR has got a lot of uh, resources available for landowners too. The number one thing I want to point to with in this conversation is connecting with your service forester and really just tapping into their expertise. They work with a lot of landowners in your area so they've got more than you know just this uh, hearsay evidence coming through with publications they've got on the ground experience. And then the DNR also has a really good website that covers all sorts of different invasive species topics and you can just get there by going to dnr.wisconsin.gov and typing invasives into the search bar. There are also other resources like the Invasive Plant Association of Wisconsin, IPAW, and they organize, or they help to organize some of these local groups called SISMAs. Um, they're cooperative invasive species management areas. The point of the map here is not to show you the specific groups, but to show you that these groups do exist. And by tapping into these networks, you can get local expertise and potentially resources that will help. More information about these groups is on the IPAW website. And then finally, the last, um, the way that I learned to do a lot of my control strategies was through volunteer opportunities. So the Driftless Area Land Conservancy does a lot of work on uh, properties that they manage as well as helping out with other properties. The Prairie Enthusiasts is a group with a lot of expertise. Arboretum uh, does a lot of this work on the property that they manage. And then I'd be curious from folks online if there are, you know, organizations within counties that are, you know, specific specific to your counties that would be valuable for other landowners to connect with. So in summary, early detection and prevention are the key. Um, new species, they spread and it's really based on our behavior and our management. So just keep yourself as a part of the system and just understand that the decisions you make are altering the way uh, the forest community is uh, changing. Um, Got to set realistic goals because this is a, a challenging prospect if you're going to work to control invasive species and you know it's just really important to have a plan. So the learning outcomes again, understand what makes a plant invasive, why it matters, um, learn about a couple of invasive plants and then we didn't get to dive into the control options and strategies as much as I would like but hopefully we can talk about that a little bit in our Q&A. So again I apologize for running long but I'm happy to stay on a little bit extra if the Q&A is vibrant. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Bill to lead our discussion.
Okay, so now's your chance to uh, pose your questions to um, Tony or our Dean or Foresters. While you're doing that, please type them into the chat. Lauren has, our colleague Lauren Larson has been putting in some of the links that were in Tony's presentation in the chat, so you can find them there. Uh, while you're typing in your questions, I wanted to give uh, our Dean or Foresters who are on a chance to talk a little bit about their experience. So why don't we start with Ben? Uh, what's what's been going on with invasives in Wapaka County? What's been your experience? And if you wanted to add anything to discussion, please do so. Uh, yeah, first of all, Tony did a great job um, explaining things, uh, you know, and doing a good summary overview of it all because you could go into further detail. And like you said, you just you got to stop somewhere. But he did a great job, and uh, I guess the top five or four or five we have Wapaka you mentioned, and we have. It all depends what you want on your land and your property. If you're trying to regenerate trees or if you just want it to be more open, you know, everybody has their own objective. So getting that, that plan down with your objectives in mind and then getting a, uh, maybe a one or a, or a two or a three step phase instead of taking on, on all at once as a big job, um, I advise landowners to do it in phases. So an example of phases is buckthorn um, the, uh, there's a, a male and a female plant. They're bas basically, uh, they're, um, dioecious if I remember right. And they're, so go at going after the seed bearing trees first. So to reduce the spread, that could be, that's an example of a, a two or three, uh, steps approach. And then <clears throat> maybe the larger, uh, prolific trees first. And then kind of going after the younger um, trees that in certain areas. So just, it can be real, a daunting experience with invasives to go after just getting all, taking it as one big step and one big leap or bound to do it. So I, uh, I advise just taking in smaller steps. Okay, thanks, Ben. Uh, Christine, did you want to add anything? <clears throat> mm, there she comes. Yeah, I just unmuted, just having a little trouble here. Um, I guess the only thing I would add would be is that the devil's in the details. Um, there's a lot of details um, when you actually make the commitment to try to do some control on these invasives. Uh, there's, and you have to make sure that you keep up with all the details. You know, I've had situations where landowners will mix herbicides to spray um, on the basil or on the stem, and they it wasn't to the um, potency that it should have been. In other words, it was the composition or the what how they mixed it. It was for foliar spray rather than do it on the stem. So, like I say, the devil's in the details. Thanks, Christine. And Lauren has been putting the contact information for uh, Ben and Christine into the chat. Feel free to give them a call if you have a specific question or we don't get to it today uh, or send them an email. Either way is fine. They, they want to know about it. If you're having problems, they, they're there to help. They also have access to a lot of great resources that can help you to achieve your go goals of controlling those uh, invasive species. We also have some other questions. Um, how about we start with the question is from Mary, uh, how best to control a buckthorn suckers from tree cut and treated previous year? Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I'm happy to start. I am working with this issue in my backyard right now. Uh, what I have done is um, tried to cut the buckthorn again below where the suckers are coming out and reapplying herbicide. So I've had this in the past where I've done a cut treatment of buckthorn and maybe the herbicide was not effective or maybe I'm cutting a bunch of them and I forget to put herbicide on on one of the stumps and you get a bunch of sprouts and generally you can still get below those suckers again um, to cut again otherwise you can just cut the suckers and apply the herbicide on to the suckers as well because when you're doing a cut stump treatment you're using a systemic herbicide so that's going to move the herbicide throughout the plant. So even if you're not dealing with the main stem, if you've got a bunch of suckers and you can get the herbicide onto those um, um, 
conductive tissues around the outer edge of the bark, you can um, get that throughout the entire plant. And if anybody else has ideas, that please jump in. I know this is something that comes up when people do widespread buckthorn uh, control with uh, like a fecon head on the front of uh, a skid steer, where you can, you know, you can grind up all the plants, but you're going to be dealing with the re-sprouts the next year. So it's a common, common issue. Okay. Um, Tony, you mentioned a couple of links for information or documents. Uh, do any of them have specific strategies or do's or don'ts for, for some of the plants you discussed? Yeah. Um, let me just pop in a screen share really quick. Um, so this is on the uh, first detector network page that I mentioned. If you go to the learn tab and go to the invasive species ID and impacts, they've got the fact sheets here for all of the invasive species um, that we covered as well as some really good videos um, from UW Extension as well. So these are going to have, these fact sheets have um, herbicide recommendations as well as um, different uh, types of timing recommendations. And then the other thing that I would really recommend is that uh, small booklet that I showed, the um, Wisconsin Terrestrial, the DNR Terrestrial Invasive Plants Guide, because that's actually got a calendar in there that says mow this species at this time, spray this species at this time, and it kind of outlines everything in a calendar with the control mechanism. So yeah, that's, that's all outlined in those documents. And Lauren has put another, uh, mentioned another book that's a resource of the IPAW, Invasive Plants of the Upper Midwest is a good, a great uh, resource to take advantage of. Here's a question about Tree of Heaven. How do you treat Tree of Heaven to control it? This is one that I um, don't have a ton of experience. I actually did a little bit when I lived in Oregon where we did uh, the basic cut and uh, treat method, but I'd be curious if any of the foresters online have worked with Tree of Heaven in Wisconsin. Um, uh, this has been, I, I have not seen it in Wapaka County, haven't worked with it, but I would assume uh, basil bark would uh, more than likely be effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're not experts on everything. There's always going to be new ones that we know, don't know about or regional ones that just haven't gotten to Wisconsin yet. So um, feel free to pose the questions. We may not have the best answer. <laughs> we'll try to do the best we can. Um, how about... When you're using Garland 4, do you need to use a bark oil or mix a bark oil with it when you're applying it onto uh, plants? In the past, I have done that, particularly when using Garland in uh, the winter. Um, it seems to help uh, that systemic herbicide be taken up by plants. Um, but yeah, uh, one caveat that we always have to say when talking about herbicides is Extension does not make recommendations about specific products. And we also um, just have to remind everybody that the label is the law when it comes to herbicides. So you really have to follow the instructions that are on the herbicide that you purchase. And if you, you know, mix something in an herbicide that is off label, that is a, technically an illegal use of that product. So it's really important to, anytime you're using herbicide, really read the instructions and follow all of the safety precautions as well as the use recommendations. Here's one that's a little bit off uh, forestry topic or woodland for woodland owners is uh, biological control of purple loose strife. Um, what happens to those beetles? So we've uh, purple loose strife is an invasive of wetland and riparian areas, and we've introduced some beetles to help control it. I've often wondered this too: those beetles just kind of die off when they're done with their job, or do they continue in the environment. So Tony, take a chance. What do you think? Do you have any know anything about purple loose strife and the beetles that are used? Yeah, I, I've i seen the beetle rearing. Um, I know that about a decade ago, this the project really took off in southeastern Wisconsin to rear these beetles. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at the fact sheet uh, <laughs> as we're here. Um, yeah, it looks like they do survive throughout the winter. Um, and it says beetle populations can... Yeah, you know, I, this is not an area where I've got a lot of expertise, but um, I, I do know that um, Ann Pierce with the, um, again, I'm referring to the Invasive Species Network with um, Extension has uh, some experience with that and we can connect uh, people with, with her as well. 
Yeah, it's a tough one. I haven't heard any problems with it. I, like you said, it's been, the technique has been around for a while. I haven't heard any the beetles becoming a problem in other plants or native plants. So that's, that's probably the best. That's a good sign. If we don't hear yeah. about it, it's a good sign that it's not becoming an issue. Yeah, I've heard of this as kind of a success story of biological control. There's always the worry that, you know, your introduction is going to have effects, but it seems to be okay, successful. How about, how about uh, what type of lumber harvesting technique would likely be the least likely to encourage or uh, entrance or spread of plant species, plant invasive species? Yeah, this is a one that I'd really like to hear from the, the foresters on. Um, but I think, you know, a big one is just having your logger or anybody who's coming on your land have clean equipment. Um, so often uh, invasive species are dispersed in mud that's caked onto a, a vehicle that, you know, if, if a logger goes from one forest to another and doesn't wash their vehicle in between, that's a really obvious way that um, invasives are, are spread around um, that can sometimes mean that you require a, a washing station for equipment when people come into your property or, um, but yeah, I think it's really important for landowners to, you know, just be aware that it's their property and they have the ability to, you know, make the rules around how people use their property or access it. Yeah, this has been uh, managing state land. We do the same thing. We, um, it is under contract that the logger uh, washes their equipment before they uh, arrive on site and then at, after they're done harvesting, they wash it again before they leave the site. It's really, you know, that's for our, our own state properties, you know, as we're stewardships of, of the public land, you know, it's up kind of up to the landowners to take that responsibility or, or work with a forester that they're hiring, uh, consulting forester to, you know, see if that can happen or make that happen. And, and also do an inventory before the timber sale on your property to see what, what invasives you do have. So you're not spreading it or moving it off-site to another site. So what about, Ben, maybe you can answer this. Is there a certain, is there some harvesting techniques that encourage the growth? Like a, a, more, a more intensive harvest that takes a lot of trees versus a harvest that just takes a tree here and there. Does one of those have a bigger impact on the spread? Yeah, I would say, you know, any harvest is gonna allow a bit more sunlight to the forest floor, but if you're doing a say an intermediate thinning where you're just reducing maybe or cutting or harvesting 20 to 25% of your um, basal area or, or trees out, then you're allowing not as much sunlight, but if you're doing a regeneration cut or some type of um, cut where you're harvesting more trees to allow seedlings to grow, yes, you are exposing more sunlight to the forest floor and potentially if you do have invasives or seed already in the seed bank there, you know, promoting them to vigorously, um, you know, take, take off. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think that's probably why it's important to do a somewhat of an inventory before the harvest to have a good idea of what may happen after the harvest. Okay. There's a question about buckthorn uh, along a riparian area where they have a creek and they they ask about uh, any ideas since there's a limited use of herbicides in those areas. And there are some herbicides that you can use over water. Any idea if they've been effective against buckthorn or what do you think? Yeah, I think in this instance, the um, cut and basil treatment is a really effective way to target herbicides. Um, you definitely don't want to do foliar sprays along riparian areas with um, herbicides that have impacts on a, a aquatic species. So that's a lot of them. A lot of herbicides will say things like do not use near water. And that is, you know, really focused on this kind of um, drift aspect of foliar spray where you're broadcasting the, um, the herbicide over a wide area. But if you, if you do the cut and uh, treatment method, you can cut the buckthorn, have your uh, small stump, and basically just paint the herbicide right onto the stump so you have no drift or um, any type of loss of that herbicide. So that's a, a pretty effective way to do it. Um, you certainly run into issues on uh, riparian, like if you're on a, a stream bank, you don't necessarily want to be pulling large buckthorn out. If you've got like a, a, a polar bear, or a weed wrench or a polar bear, like I reference, um, you don't want to probably be, stir be disturbing that soil right on the stream bank and causing, you know, erosion that way. Um, and I saw there's a couple questions about those uh, polar 
uh, bears or weed wrenches. And if you just Google that term, a couple different companies make something along those lines. If you, if you write in weed wrench, uh, write read, weed wrench into the search bar and they're anywhere from, you know, 60 to 150 bucks, depending on the size, but it is just amazing the size of trees that you can pull out. And if you're not able to use herbicides and you've got an area where you're not worried about erosion, uh, it's a perfect tool. Yeah, you had some great pictures in there, uh, Tony, of using a sponge to paint the cut stumps. You don't even have to have a spray bottle. You just can basically, or a brush, you can just paint the herbicide right onto the, uh, into the cut stump. There's also basil bark treatment you mentioned is a good one. Uh, and another one is the hack and spray where you can hack into the side of the tree with a hatchet and then spray right above it into that, into the cut. That's a good way to introduce an herbicide without having to cut down the tree if you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Lauren has put the puller tool, a link for the puller tool onto uh, the page uh, or into the chat. So if you really want that one, we don't recommend any product for name, but uh, take do some shopping. There's a number of them out there, as Tony said. Um, that's just a link to a bunch of them. That's not that's not one specific one. Okay. Yeah, it looks like Doug has the extractigator. <laughs> I love it. So yeah, all kinds of options. Yeah, there's another question about the plants with the uh, burrs and um, there's one of those is invasive, if I remember correctly, or is, is a non-native. I can't think of it, what it is. Is it? I'll go ahead. Some of the most common burr plants I'm seeing are um, Virginia stick seed. It's got like these tiny little, they almost look like uh, little tiny bugs, um, but they are very common. That's a, a native um, native plant. Uh, burdock has the large, large burrs. That's a biennial. So you'll see the big rosettes the first year and then the, the flower head the next year. Um, so again, that's going to come down to the plant's life cycle. With a, a burdock, you can remove, they've got a giant tap root and you can you know, potentially try to dig that out or you can uh, focus on, you know, the flowering part of the plant and just pull, pull the flowering stock so that it doesn't have the ability to produce seeds and that's going to prevent the spread. Um, yeah, that's definitely one that can impact recreation. So that could be an instance of a, you know, a native where you have a native invasive species that's, you know, having some kind of a harm on your goal for the property. But yeah, I guess I'm not thinking of any other specifics. There's a series of uh, tree tick foils. They're um, pretty common. They have the half moon looking shape sticker that gets to you, covers your, your jeans or pants. Um, those are native, pretty common. They end the summer, early fall. Well, that's the questions we have. We're probably run over a little bit. I'm glad we had a chance to answer some of your questions. Thanks everybody for, for participating. As we said, we're recording this session. Uh, we'll be posting it and sharing the link for everybody that's registered, only for those folks that are registered. We'll keep it live for about a week and then take it down. So if you missed something or wanted to see this again, uh, you'll get another chance to watch the recording. Other than that, uh, on Thursday, we'll be talking about, I forget, Tony? Planning, Planning uh, yes. programs and people. So it's going to be all sorts of resources potentially to, you know, help you manage your invasive species or um, all kinds of different stuff. So yeah, we'll be, uh, it'll be Julie Van Cleve, the um, Vernon County Forester presenting next week and we'll all be online and um, yeah, feel free in the meantime to send questions if you've got them to forestry at extension.wis.edu. Happy to answer in the meantime. Looking forward to seeing everybody on Thursday. Um, yeah, and uh, again, I will send out a follow-up uh, to this with the links and uh, some of the comments that were made in the, the chat and, and I'll share that as long as, along with any resources or references for our Thursday night class. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll see you Thursday. Okay, perfect, sounds good.